Hi guys, it is a cold, wet, nasty Sunday morning here in the end times. We have made it to Sunday, April 6, 2014. Glad to have some rain. I can't get to my rocks. I can't get to my rocky pulpit, so I'm coming at you from under the Bodai tree today. I hear sounds like Brother Blue Jay has cornered Brother Snake back behind me. I'm getting ready to go to a week-long picking party, I think, here in this dreary day. But before I do, before I disappear, into the woodwork for a week I have time to get one more doomsday sermon out on this dreary Sunday as I bring you my latest Bible of the Apocalypse spelling out what we can expect to unfold on this planet and this is a brand new book from somebody I have never heard of a fellow named Donald Prothero. Donald Prothero is emeritus, or is it emeritus, professor of geology at Occidental College and lecturer in geobiology at the California Institute of Technology. He has published 32 books up until now, and this is his newest book from this scientist, and his newest one off the press is number 33, Reality Check, How Science Deniers Threaten Our Future. And so this is this scientist, this... Uh, Kinda, he calls himself a, a paleobiologist, or so he, he can look at, he's good at looking at historical records and trends and stuff. And so what he is looking at in this book is, is all of these uh, goddamn, and they come in all stripes, these, these science deniers who as all of the great minds on this planet bring in more and more and more information that this planet is screwed, that human civilization and the entire planet are at literally the eve of destruction here in the early 21st century. You have all of these people being confronted with this mounting Mount Everest of scientific evidence of the shape we are in uh, and the crisis unfolding on this planet. How all of these head up their ass various brands of utopians and we're talking the Alex Jones, Glenn Beck crowd. You know who we're talking about of course who gets the most uh, attention recently, and you better believe they are skewered in this book, are the global warming climate change deniers. You better believe Donald Prothero has a lot to say about them. But anyway, so what, what Donald does here, what Dr. Donald does here, is he goes through the laundry list uh, of all of these horse shit levels of denial and you know spelling out how it, it, if we continue to deny the mountain of scientific evidence about what is unfolding on this planet we have nobody but ourselves to blame you cannot blame it on the scientists so anyway he goes through uh, all sorts of uh, of specific examples you know, building up to his uh, his final thesis about how science deniers are threatening our future, and of course, he he starts out by looking at at some crises that we have diverted when uh, when policymakers paid attention. You know, talking about the ozone hole and uh, things like that. 
Then he goes in, okay, of course he looks at global warming deniers. He looks, then he looks at creationism, intelligent design, and the denial of humanity's place in nature. He goes out there looks at vaccine deniers. I am on the fence about that. Uh, AIDS denialism, talking about snake oil, then astrology, then he goes into peak oil. And, and I could do a rant about any one of these chapters. So this man, uh, you better believe this man is a firm believer in not just peak oil, but peak everything. Uh, Donald Perthrero is not like Hambone Littletail on the fence about peak oil. He thinks that peak oil and peak everything else on this planet, which is just uh, another way of saying over consumption, over extraction, and over consumption uh, of all sorts of our natural resources bringing this civilization and this planet down. But what do you think Donald Prothero's, what is he leading up to? Well, this is actually the second to the last chapter I am going to uh, read from. This is the, the last of his specific examples of the number one way we are going to A, destroy human civilization and probably the planet in the process. And this would be chapter 12 titled, Far From the Matting Crowd human overpopulation and its consequences where Donald Prothero sounds like any other ranting doomsday prophet boiling down the issue to the number one, the number one uh, environmental, social, military, whatever words you want to use, the number one problem on this planet, bringing down global industrial civilization, which is a good thing, and bringing down planet Earth, which is a bad thing, is overpopulation. It all gets back to overpopulation. Overconsumption gets back to overpopulation. Global warming gets back to overpopulation. And so I am going to read at length from this chapter from this scientist. And we will find out at the end of this chapter how optimistic this man is about the situation on this planet. How full of hope this scientist is. Okay. He leads off the ticking time bomb. <clears throat> All of the issues of resource depletion discussed in the previous chapter boil down to one fundamental issue. Human population size and growth. And, uh, you know, he goes all the way back to 1729 when Jonathan Swift uh, in his satire, A Modest Proposal, understanding this. And then of course, uh, 1798, his hero and mine, uh, Thomas Malthus, saw the huge explosion in the growth of poor people in early industrial Britain and pessimistically predicted that human populations would continue to grow out of control, eventually held in check only by the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which he lists as war, disease, famine, and death. And since that time, scholars and pundits 
and scientists have looked at the issue and held a wide range of opinions of how serious overpopulation is and what could and should be done about it. And this is, uh, it, there is no other issue including global warming uh, as he points out here, and I've pointed out uh, many other doomsday prophets about how nobody is, uh, is talking about this issue. That all of these goddamn mainstream environmental organizations, you know, talking about global warming and overconsumption of resources, blah, blah, blah. And everybody is too chicken shit to talk about the number one issue on planet Earth. This book was written uh, within the last six months. The number one issue facing planet Earth is overpopulation. Pull your head out of your ass. Anybody who does not understand what the number one problem facing planet Earth in the year 2014 is. And I love it, he, he, uh, he peppers this, uh, he peppers this chapter with all of these quotes uh, from a lot of other uh, doomsday uh, prophets, uh, mainly Al Bartlett, of uh, Paul Ehrlich, he quotes at length, and Isaac Asimov, this is a quote from Isaac Asimov, which is the greater danger? nuclear warfare or the population explosion. The latter, absolutely. <clears throat> to bring about nuclear war, someone has to do something. Someone has to at least press a button <clears throat> to bring about destruction by overcrowding, mass starvation, anarchy, the destruction of our most cherished values. There is no need to do anything. We need only to do nothing except what comes naturally and breed. How easy it is to do nothing. That was uh, Isaac Asimov. Uh, I, weighing in on this and so then he traces he does he kind of I, I've been uh, quoting Jared Diamond at length the, the past several weeks he certainly uh, looks in at Jared Diamond's research quotes him he as Jared Diamond does and as I have been doing the past several weeks he traces humanity's rise and then, of course, he has all of these uh, famous hockey stick graphs. The number one, I don't know if you can see this or not, guys, the hockey stick graph of human population over the past few thousand years. And then he does the math where he borrows a lot from my hero, the late, great Albert Bartlett, who died last fall. He uh, spends a lot of time on uh, trying to explain the concept of the exponential function that nobody understands what something as seemingly innocent as, as like a 3% growth rate, what this really means. Anyway, he breaks all of this down. <clears throat> okay, but moving ahead deeper into his chapter. Okay, of course, it is obvious that nature does not allow things to reach such absurd astronomical quantities. Here we run up against something we discussed in previous chapters, the limits of growth and resources. In natural systems, and you better believe there is nothing natural about the modern human system, 
in natural systems, populations may expand exponentially in limited circumstances in which there are huge amounts of space or other resources. But as soon as they go through a few doubling cycles, as we have done in the past hundred years, as soon as they go through a few doubling cycles, they run up against the limits of their environment and either reach a stable state or have a population crash and die out altogether if they exhaust all their resources. Ecologists talk about this steady plateau of no further growth as an equilibrium state or the carrying capacity of the environment. Nature exhibits this in many different animal and plant populations, but humans seem to think they are exempt from the laws of nature and that they can keep growing definitely. And then he goes out the, setting out examples to illustrate this folly. Uh, about uh, that, that, that we can just keep on growing. And so then he goes there to the, uh, to the next phase of this chapter, In Growth We Trust, quoting Albert Bartlett. I think I've, uh, I've mentioned this one before, but it's worth repeating. My old buddy, Doomsday Prophet Al, talking about smart growth, I was mentioning yesterday how about a two minute walk from this chair, they are getting ready to break ground on 352 smart growth condos. I can almost see them when the leaves aren't on the trees. I will be able to. Here's Albert Bartlett on smart growth. Smart growth destroys the environment. Dumb growth destroys the environment. The only difference is that smart growth does it with good taste. It's like booking passage on the Titanic. Whether you go first class or steerage, the result is the same. Growth destroys the environment, meaning human population and economic growth. Good Lord. Uh, okay. This raises an even larger point about resources and population. The global inequity in how they are produced and consumed. And this is where he talks about all of this, uh, uh, the rise of China and India and all of these developing economies. This, this, guys, for anyone who has heard this, 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 what this man is saying, I don't really know who he thinks his audience is. To anyone listening to my rant on Humpty Dumpty Tribe, this is pretty much kindergarten. He is just boiling it all down for anyone who does not. Uh, understand how uh, how these developing economies getting hold of our standard of living. As Bartlett points out, the real enemy here is the perverse psychology that growth is good. Our national motto is in God we trust, but should be in growth we trust. Jesus, you know, quoting all of these politicians and everybody, uh, it's, it's economic growth, 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 growth. All right, voters think about their own pocketbooks first and seldom let 
global geopolitics or other issues take precedence unless there is a war or unless the economy is growing robustly and they have the affluence to worry about other issues. Yet, not all growth is good. Cancer is a form of growth that we fear, and the faster it grows, the faster the patient dies. We should realize that growth that leads to bad consequences is much like cancer. So, the message we are receiving from the mathematics of exponential growth and limited resources is that we have very little time left and we cannot afford to grow too much more or consume things too quickly. Otherwise, we will just set ourselves up for a crash when the world is much too overcrowded and there are far fewer and fewer resources for everyone. Instead, we need to view the earth as a small lifeboat with limited supplies and we should be trying to reach a stable state, not a growing demand that our lifeboat planet Earth cannot support. Jesus, and he goes, uh, he, he goes back to 1978 uh, article by Al Bartlett and, and, you know, the limits of growth. When was that? 1972. How all of these early warnings completely ignored. Every one of these warnings completely ignored by the overpopulation deniers, these head up their asses, everyone from Alex Jones to these mainstream environmental organizations completely burying their heads up their asses about this. Uh, and as they continue, uh, all right, getting back to his rant, most assume growth is a good thing and argue that we have enough fuel resources to supply us for a long time, blah, 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 <coughs> missing from all of these optimistic estimates is the reality that if we suddenly expand our mining and consumption of, well, coal, it will not last very long. Jesus, and, uh, and, and you, you know, in talking about how all of this stuff is ramping up, and how many times have I uh, mentioned uh, the, the, the comic strip Pogo, said it best. We have met the enemy and he is us. We humans are to blame for overpopulating this planet and as we can now see the consequences of too many people and too much consumption, we are still blindly committed to the disastrous policies and thinking that got us into this mess in the first place. We are suffering from a dangerous cancer growing too fast and we prescribe more cancer as a cure for the problem. Yet there have long been voices that have argued a different viewpoint. There are limits to growth and we are just passengers on this fragile lifeboat called Earth and must be careful about ruining, ruining it not only for ourselves but for all life on this planet. And then he goes back uh, to quote 
Al Bartlett again, this quote from Al. Can you think of any problem in any area of human endeavor on any scale from microscopic to global whose long-term solution is any in any demonstrable way aided, assisted, or advanced by further increases in population locally, nationally, or globally. And uh, so then he talks about this absolute horseshit that all of these overpopulation deniers talking about uh, the lowering of a few birth rates on the planet. And even in view of all of these optimistic projections, there are still alarmingly high birth rates in much of the impoverished and underdeveloped world, especially in Latin America, the Middle East, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And I've been, I'm not going to get into a whole nother Sub-Saharan Africa report. I think it's the outside of Afghanistan, the top 19 of the top 20 highest birth rates on this planet in Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, then he uh, talks about uh, all of these up their uh, head up their ass uh, cornucopians, as he call them, who might better be described as corn utopians, calling out Julian Simon, Bjorn Lomborg, and Matt Ridley claim with a straight face that 17, that, I'm sorry, that 7 to 15 billion people on the planet is no problem. Somehow, the laws of supply and demand will magically find a lot more other natural resources to sustain this gigantic excess of humans, completely ignoring all the data that show resources are rapidly vanishing and no increase in prices will make more of them. They have a touching belief that somehow the net wealth of the world will just keep on growing and that the richer nations will keep the poorer nations affluent as well. Never mind the facts of the exponential growth dynamic and the evidence we discussed earlier that cancerous growth is a bad thing, not a good thing. Cornucopians seem to think that a planet with wall-to-wall -wall people and cows and rats and no room for nature or anything not in service of humans is a good thing. Such abstract conceptions of planetary well-being may comfort the rich and powerful snug in their mansions in the U.S. or Europe who want to protect their place in society, but one only needs to travel to China or India or any number of African countries to see the effects of population growth. Oh, Jesus. Uh, then he refers you to this great uh, group, Optimum Population Trust, which, of course, uh, Alex Jones calls out as one of the leaders of the New World Order depopulation agenda. Of course, how we proceed with the problem of overpopulation is a matter of policy and political structure uh, discussion, but 
except for the cornucopians, there seems to be a widespread consensus among most scholars and scientists that 7 billion people is already too many. And uh, there he goes from looking at humans only to looking at every other uh, species that share the planet with us and quoting Sir David Attenborough as he moves in to the sixth mass extinction discussion. Sir David Attenborough, instead of controlling the environment for the benefit of the human population, maybe we should instead control the population to ensure the survival of our environment. You know, moving ahead about how uh, overpopulation just bringing humans down. Uh, Throughout all these analyses and discussions, the writers we have cited who are favorable to more population growth always make the assumption that humans are all that matter and no other species or ecosystem is important except in the context of supporting us. And then he quotes this guy, I don't know who this is, but I like him, uh, Niles Eldridge. Okay, anyway, the answer to all of this is, is clear. Humans have been an ecological disaster, especially in the past few centuries, and the natural world that sustains us is being destroyed at an alarming rate. As Niles Eldridge put it, quote, we are like loose cannons, able to wreak great damage on our own and particularly dangerous if our effects happen to coincide with physically induced changes that are also causing extinction. Uh, then he talks about, he goes into rainforest destruction. He spends quite a bit of time talking about the destruction of rainforest uh, all over this world uh, and how that we're taking out all of the animals in the rainforest even before we're bringing down the rainforest itself and the same can be said for the marine ecosystems. Uh, I've been uh, as the the oceans of the world collapse and even as human populations increase we can count less and less on food from the ocean to sustain us and the dying of the oceans due to greenhouse warming will be as catastrophic as any mass extinction that has happened in the in the distant past and uh, you know talking about the ramping up of the six extinction one or two species may not make a big difference, but we really do not know how many can be lost before the entire planetary ecosystem collapses. In the case of dying coral reefs and vanishing rainforests, we may already be past the point of no return. And nevertheless, there are many cornucopians and others who insist that humans are too smart and inventive to ever wipe themselves out with 
an ecological catastrophe. And we are now going to get to the last paragraph of Donald Prothero's rant on overpopulation. You know, this is the point where Jared Diamond and David Attenborough and Edward O. Wilson and all these others know God damn well how hopeless this situation is. So, how does Donald Prothero weigh in on, on optimism and hope going forward from this point? As historian Will Durant wrote, Quote, civilization exists by geological consent subject to change without notice, close quote. I guess he's talking about global civilization here. It is a much more fragile thing than most of us realize, and history and archaeology show us that humans can indeed make stupid decisions and outstrip their resources before their culture vanish vanishes. As we look on a planet with 7 billion people and with a huge standing population, meaning right today, that has the potential to double in a few decades, and we see all the signs that the planet is already overpopulated beyond our carrying capacity. We must ask ourselves if we now are among those cultures who foolishly plunged forward with bad policies that ensured their extinction. In fact, 99% of all species on earth that have ever lived are now extinct. As a species, we have only been around for about 100,000 years, much less than the average of several million years for most species. Okay, and boil it all down, guys. Tell us how hopeful you are. As a biologist and paleontologist, I see no reason to be optimistic. I see no reason to be optimistic that humans are destined for survival especially given our bad habits and propensity for creating things that threaten us even more than overpopulation such as nuclear weapons and global warming. Getting down to the last sentence of this overpopulation rant. Sure, the planet and life will survive at some low level of diversity populated by ever hardy rats and cockroaches, but it is doubtful that humans will be around to see it. Are you listening to one of my doomsday rants on this rainy day? Okay, and that brings me to the end of my doomsday sermon on this day from Reality Check, How Science Deniers Threaten Our Future. That was my, uh, that was my friend Franny who thinks, I am, uh, thinks I'm one of these whack jobs. Whack job? She was, she was, uh, she was hoping a few nights ago that the downfall of the planet will not be violent. Anything but violent, right? <laughs> this is one of my, uh, my, uh, residents of our unintentional community thinking that Hambo Little Tail and Donald R. Prothero 
are a bunch of doom and gloomer whack jobs. Anyway, starting to rain again, I am uh, supposed to be on my way to a picking party for the next week, so uh, I don't know if uh, I will be around for any rants for the next week or not, although I think I'm going to just hang out here in my trailer for another night. So I may or may not be back at you with a rant tomorrow, but I will not be back at you with my Doomsday Sermon next Sunday, so I will return in two weeks with a new Doomsday Sermon but for this one, thank you and amen, Brother Donald, for your reality check on overpopulation. Bye, guys.